Hello and welcome to the final live program of this year's Alumni Week. And the panel that today we will be hearing from is on mental health and loneliness. I think all of you will agree that this is an important topic to be covered in any conference, any meeting currently. And uh, based on the demand from many of you, as well as submissions of the lightning talks, the school has uh, decided to focus on that. And I hope you will enjoy and be informed by the next 60 minutes of uh, discussion. My name is Shekhar Saxena and I'm a professor for the practice of global mental health at the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And I'll be moderating today's session. We have three panelists and I'll introduce them as we go ahead. But just to recapitulate, mental health and loneliness are extremely important. They were important all the time, but they're even more important currently as we are passing through the pandemic. And I'm talking about mental health and not mental disorders, which is different. Some people have a disorder and they obviously they need services, they need care, and they need all the uh, services that one can need. But mental health is about all of us. It's not only about those people who might have a disorder. It's an essential attribute for all of us. It's an integral part of health. In fact, it's an in integral part of our very living. And so it's important for all of us. It's about us and not, not about some of them. We know that globally, services for mental health problems are very deficient. In fact, I often say that when it comes to mental health, all countries are developing countries and USA is just one of them. And during these uh, uh, COVID times, the need has increased and the supply of services has decreased. So there is perhaps not a better time to talk about what to do for mental health and loneliness for the societies, for the communities that we represent. And it being a very major part of public health, we are delighted to present this panel uh, discussing what can be done about that. All week long, the alumni working program has examined public health issues. And if mental health and loneliness were not included, there would be something really missing. And it's an issue which is for the whole life course, starting from, in fact, before the birth, but going on to the end of the life. We have uh, three uh, alumni. I will uh, ask them to present in five minutes. It's a short time, but that will leave time for interaction. Their initial thoughts about uh, this topic and based on the work that they have been doing after they left the school. The first panelist is Cynthia Cohen. She's the director of Pathways, Pathway Partners, a practice that works globally to support families by focusing on therapeutic needs of primary, primarily young people, which is an important phase of life, adolescents and young adults to address their individual needs and to develop approaches that could improve public mental health. Cynthia graduated from Harvard in 1976 with a master's of science in health policy and management. So Cynthia, over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here. And it's particularly exciting to see the progression of the School of Public Health since I was there many years ago, where analysis was really central. And now the school is much more focused on values, including mental health, but also anti-racism and um, inequities. And it's been very, interesting all week to hear the different discussions about the life course and aging. And there was a lot of discussion about the predeterminants of healthy aging. And um, I think it's really a good opportunity today to talk about can improving mental health affect those um, predeterminants and how can we intervene in, um, in ways to make things better. And of course you can't, it's really hard to think about improving somebody's mental health if they're starving or in living in squalor or have no education. So those things are really essential. 
And at the same time, I think it's important to look at the ways that we have learned in our that that can be helpful to to everyone and see what we can do to bring those um, practices to, to a broader group of the public. So I've um, I've worked extensively in um, academic psychiatry and academic medicine and the government and in education. And for about 12 years, I've been working as a what's called a therapeutic educational consultant. And I work a lot with, um, I go around the country assessing programs and help families find them when somebody in their family is not doing well for any reason. So I work a lot with what are called therapeutic wilderness programs, which are an amazingly effective approach to helping someone embrace their strengths and learn how to handle their challenges in positive ways. And I think the reason that this is important because the field is mainly directed to people who can pay, but there's a lot of money out there and programs like juvenile justice that would more than pay for those kids to go to wilderness instead. And so I think we have to think about um, the ways that we can apply this. But what we have learned is that um, a participant going into the wilderness for six to 14 weeks where they're living in nature um, with no technology, uh, with a peer group that's really working hard to be the best they can be, can be amazingly effective. Um, people have are with highly trained staff, 24 hours a day, therapists come out into the into the wilderness a couple of days a week and work with them and orchestrate the whole system. Families are working on their own issues and their dynamics. Um, and we, I have seen so many people and there's research that confirms this, get their lives back. They find ways to embrace their strengths, which many people can't. I think our society is almost predicated on avoidance of dealing with things. And um, we, there, people are, are not, um, we don't have a mores where people are living intensely and working intensely to be the best they can be. So what happens when they get to wilderness is they develop almost universally self-efficacy through physical things, through interpersonal things, through individually created initiatives. And this development of self-efficacy allows them to be motivated to grow and to change and to um, be accountable for how they've been before. And I, they, people then begin to develop healthier coping strategies and improved relationships. Um, they work on their family relationships and they end with a greater sense of well-being and an ability to be productive in society. It sounds like magic, but it's very um, orchestrated, very planned, and, and, and very clear. The thing is, you can't bring this to everybody, and there are a lot of community wilderness programs that bring someone into the wilderness for 24 hours a year, and that's a great thing, probably, but, it, and we know that even, you know, being near a park is healthier than not, but I, this, I think, is something that could be good for, could be really effective and is less expensive than what we currently spend in juvenile justice. At the same time, we've learned that the community is really important. And the young people come into these groups where their community is all working to be the most they can. So I think we also have to think about how we can enhance community structures throughout our society, giving people agency and finding people who are already there as leaders and who you know, reach, reaching people in their communities to help them develop um, stronger connections. Um, so I think that's what, I think that's my five minutes. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, for describing your very interesting program. And as you say, societies are predicated to neglect some issues and mental health certainly is one of those issues which traditionally has been neglected in all societies. So thank you for sharing your experience and be prepared to answer some questions. But before that, we go on to the next panelist. And from USA, we go all the way to Germany in Munich to Dr. Elif Sindik, the class of 2001. She did her MPH in clinical effectiveness, born in Turkey. Dr. Sindik is now the medical director of a neuropsychiatric center where she works primarily with mental health immigrant population. Dr. Sindik, we pass over to you for sharing your experience. Um, hello, everybody. It's a really, it's a big honor to be with you. 
I uh, miss the HSBH. Uh, I made a lot of really good friends there and learned a lot for life, not only the topics you teach. Uh, I'm now in uh, back in Germany for several years. I'm a psychiatrist and psychotherapist. Do you want to give me the next slide? Um, just to tell you a little bit about my work uh, space, um, I um, studied medicine. I uh, was at the Mount Sinai School in New York. Then I did my doctoral thesis in uh, Boston at uh, a lab who belongs to the Harvard system. And then I did the clinical effectiveness program and the master of public health. And then I came back to Germany. And here uh, in 2010, I started a big uh, healthcare center we, um, with psychiatry, psychotherapy. Then we added neurology and psychosomatic diseases. Then we opened the second healthcare center in 2019. And uh, now we have more than 3,000 patients we uh, treat in both centers within three months. So we also have five nursing homes we are taking care of, which was very sad during uh, COVID times. And um, in 2012, I started to advise the government about mental health issues. I tried to contribute to uh, new services, not only for immigrants, uh, just uh, to, to lobby for all sorts of mental health issues. Um, we started to re do research. It's mainly about the issues of immigrants because we still don't have enough data and we're uh, ve um, very welcoming you to join us, to do cooperations with us. Um, you can find us on Academia and on ResearchGate. Uh, we um, are very productive um, for the last three years now. Um, another issue we or another very good thing we can offer is diversity. We are really uh, taking care of um, all sorts of patients because we are 70% people with migration background in our, uh, our staff. We speak 13 languages and that's really like uh, Georgian, Bosnian, uh, Hungarian, Ukrainian, Russian, Italian, and so on. And we, we teach, I'm teaching um, doctors about culturally uh, competent uh, care of, of trans, uh, of, about transcultural competency to um, uh, address immigrants correctly and treat them correctly. Next slide, please. What we do is um, we look at personality disorders, trauma. Um, obviously, we have a lot of uh, asylum seekers right now from Syria um, and also now again from Afghanistan. Anxiety, depression, these are very important factors uh, about um, the mental health of people from other countries living in Germany, addiction also. They, uh, we look at their lower income, we look at their socioeconomic issues, we look at their, um, also we see they have more somatic diseases than uh, people in their home country. For example, diabetes is much more in Turks in Germany than in Turks in Turkey and then in Germans in Germany. So this is also another health issue. Um, and also we look into um, broken families, loneliness, et cetera. Next slide, please. A very important issue that hasn't been addressed yet is dementia. The people who came here came 60 years ago. They were very young. Uh, only 25% who applied to work in Germany were accepted. Now uh, we see these people are getting older and all the people from uh, mostly um, Southern Europe who came to Germany um, will have uh, will have probably some sort of cognitive issues in when they get older than 60, 70. And um, we address this issue. We have uh, so far no services for these people. And as you know, just one uh, thing, we have a lot of females who are illiterate from other countries. And we have uh, a lot of uh, people 
when they have dementia, the first thing they forget is the language they learned the last. So German will be gone and we need services for these people and we're trying to lobby for that. Next slide, please. And um, this is something I already uh, told you about. We looked at uh, the psychological impact of COVID on immigrants. And I just put out, we have a lot of variables we looked at. One was that they are, um, because the unemployment rate went up a lot in Germany, um, they were uh, very, uh, um, uh, scared about their economic situation. And the other thing was uh, they were very scared, a uh, communitarian uh, uh, set of mind uh, about infecting their own elderly or some elderly people. They were very scared of being the, the reason for others to die maybe. And uh, next slide. Um, this is the last one I think uh, I just mentioned that uh, people with a migration background have a lot of somatic issues that are actually, we have to look into that because I think it's because of discrimination, it's because of a lot of other things, uh, othering we say to that, uh, that makes them have uh, worse uh, socioeconomic and life conditions. First, a German has to be found for a job, then a European, then a non-European. So uh, the possibility of getting employed is very low uh, for people. Um, um, I think I have to wrap up. Uh, so we found out that people uh, with a migration background have are more obese and uh, have more depression and a higher rate of the typical diabetes type two you get when you're uh, when you have uh, um, metabolic uh, issues. Next slide. Thank you so much. Merkel can now go to sleep forever. She did a very good job. Sixteen years as our chancellor, and uh, we just had the elections. We are not sure how it's going to go on. And uh, greetings from Munich in Germany so far. Thank you very much, Alif, for sharing your experience with us and also showing that mental health is important throughout the life course, including in the elderly, where the dementia prevalence is becoming very high all over the world, but especially in those societies which are aging uh, more quickly than some of the other societies. So thank you so much for sharing that. As a third panelist, we have Kelsey Killam, uh, one of the recent members of the Illuminus group. She passed in the class of 2020 uh, F with MPH degree from the Department of Health and Social Behavior. She is now the founder of the Social Health Labs, where she partners with cross-sector organizations on local, state, and national initiatives to address the epidemic of loneliness and create more socially connected communities. With a background in the mental health research and healthcare innovation, Castley is also a consultant and writer and her ideas about loneliness and connection have been featured in uh, very prestigious uh, newspapers like the New York Times, Washington Post and Scientific American. So thank you for joining us and the floor is yours now. Thank you so much, Shakar, for the introduction, and thank you to everyone joining today. It's great to be here with you. So for the next few minutes, I wanted to share a few thoughts on my perspective um, on this topic of mental health and loneliness and share about a bit about the theme of why a connected life is a healthy life. So we can go to the next uh, slide. So I'd like to start off with a question, actually. What single factor brings people joy and meaning protects them from illness and disease, and even extends their lifespan? Well, the title of this may have given away the answer, but if we go to the next slide, the answer is human connection. And over 50 years of research, including by many Harvard Chan faculty members like Lisa Berkman, Ichiro Kawachi, and others, has shown definitively that social relationships are one of the most important contributors to public health through the life course. 
For example, people who have so close social ties are less likely to develop depression or cardiovascular disease. They have stronger immune systems and prolonged cognitive function. And they even have a 50% increased likelihood of survival. So as we reflect on the theme of this year's Alumni Week, I think it's absolutely essential that human connection is part of that conversation. You can go to the next slide. Unfortunately, not everyone is gaining the health benefits of human connection in our society. And in fact, isolation and loneliness are far too common. To give you a bit of a sense of this, Anywhere from 20 to 60% of the US population are often isolated or lonely, depending on which study you read. And two in five people feel like their social relationships are not actually meaningful. So clearly there's a discrepancy here between the life-giving human relationships that we need and what we're actually receiving and, and living each day. And of course the pandemic has challenged everyone's social relationships in new ways and really shown a spotlight on this, this particular issue. So addressing this was actually the focus of my studies at Harvard Chan, and it continues to be the focus of my work now. So we can go to the next slide. So there are a few ways that I'm going about uh, tackling this issue. The first is communicating. I'm very passionate about sharing the research as well as actionable ways that we can apply the research with different audiences. I regularly write articles for different outlets, give talks at different organizations, and do what I can to spread the message about uh, this space. A second way that, uh, that I work on this is through collaborations. I partner with individuals, uh, communities and organizations to actually implement solutions and, and put this into practice. So I consult and advise different startups and nonprofits in this space, um, as well as co-lead different initiatives. And finally, another way that I'm tackling this is through catalyzing, through so really supporting and advancing innovative ways to address social isolation and loneliness and promote human connection. So at my organization, Social Health Labs, I lead a program where we fund grass Roots community builders across the country, and also a thought leadership series where we're convening people across different sectors to co-generate solutions at the national level. So I won't go into much further detail now since we don't have a lot of time, but if you did want to learn more about this work, feel free to do so on my website, casleykillam.com, or on my organization's website, which is socialhealthlabs.com. You can go to the next slide. So I began with a question and I want to close up with kind of an invitation to reflect on uh, as we continue this conversation today. So I invite you to see the pandemic as a reset, as a pause, and as a transition from the society that we've been living in into the society that we hope to live in. I invite you to reimagine how the technologies we use, the communities that we live in, and the social norms that we live by can actually better serve our physical, mental, and social well being, and how we can bring that about that change. And finally, I invite you to consider in both your work as a public health professional and in your personal lives, how human connection specifically can be at the core of that, because it's absolutely essential to mental health and to public health throughout the life course. So with that percolating in your mind, I will wrap up. We can go to the next slide. And I look forward to diving into all of this in much more detail uh, in the discussion to follow. Thank you very much, uh, Kasli, for uh, giving us uh, a bird's eye view of the kind of work that you're doing and how it is relevant for the society in general. Now it's the question time, and I'm very happy that all of you have maintained the time uh, uh, that was allotted to you so that we have more time for discussion. And I would like to really ask uh, a question to each one of you. Although you have already explained to some extent how the COVID pandemic has affected the mental health and loneliness for the society, but also uh, in what way it has affected your work. But I would really like you to expand on that and tell us uh, whether uh, you think the changes that we are, we are seeing during the pandemic on mental health and loneliness, how severe are they? How much are they affecting the society? How much has it affected your work? And is it going to last? What are the kind of things that we need to be prepared for in future for mental health and loneliness? So I'd like to begin actually with you, Kasli, because you are on the screen. 
and then go on to the other two panelists. Sure, that's a great question. Thank you. Well, the first part of your question is about how the pandemic has changed my work. And I would say that it has brought urgency to it. I mean, obviously, I went into the Harvard Chan program focused on this issue already. Um, and before that, you know, isolation and loneliness were quite common. Um, it was recognized as a public health issue by some researchers and academics. Um, and certainly, there had been some attention in the media. But I think that when COVID-19 hit and suddenly all of us were trying to grapple how to stay socially connected with social distancing, with quarantines, and how to navigate all of that. It really brought this topic to the mainstream and has accelerated the amount of work and investment in, in solutions for this issue. So it's been as sad as it is that that's the, the catalyst for this, it's been very exciting to see the momentum in this space and to see the solutions that are emerging and, and, and new approaches. Um, the second part of your, your question was about, you know, how big this issue is, I believe. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I wrote an article last year in August, so a year ago now. Um, so I, about six months into the pandemic, uh, looking at some of the research that was emerging on loneliness prevalence specifically. And there were a few re really rigorous studies that had come out following people before the pandemic, as well as during, um, to look at their levels of loneliness. And for the most part, they had stayed the same. And in some cases, people actually felt more socially connected. And I think what this signals is that we can be resilient. We can stay socially connected um, and, and in touch with one another, even when we're apart. Um, but at the same time, there's been a recognition that our relationships are absolutely essential. And I think we all have come away feeling a greater sense of appreciation for it. And so that's something that I really hope we hold on to um, so that we can kind of solidify the work that's going on in the space and the impact. Thank you very much for sharing that experience. Uh, I now I would like to invite uh, Elif to answer the same question, actually. How has the society changed for mental health and loneliness and how it has changed your work? What do you see happening in future? Elif, please. The pandemic showed me we, um, uh, especially psychiatrists, psychotherapists were needed uh, much more uh, than uh, we are, we are all already not enough, but uh, we um, had a lot of people coming to us uh, three times uh, more than usually we uh, had um, uh, people wanting our uh, help, our advice, and um, we had uh, a lot of uh, I mean, Germany is lucky um, uh, concern, um, in comparison to the US or other countries. We have healthcare insurance for everybody and uh, psychological uh, advice or um, counseling help, uh, uh, psychotherapy is paid by the healthcare insurance, by every healthcare insurance. So um, that's uh, a big advantage. Um, in the whole uh, picture, um, but we don't have enough uh, people providing it. That's the problem. We need more education. We need more uh, support. Um, we don't even have physician's assistants. We just start these programs. I'm also teaching in one of these programs and uh, I've seen your uh, healthcare force uh, 20 years ago was way better than ours is right now. Um, uh, concerning immigrants, uh, the, the pandemia um, made them fear a lot of things like the borders uh, were closed. They were uh, anxious what's gonna happen if something happens to me, where will I go? Uh, people parenting uh, alone and so on. Special needs, uh, people with special needs um, had a lot of uh, difficulties and we couldn't address all these needs, that's for sure. But we have way more social help than in other countries, I must say. So we are comparable to Scandinavia. Uh, um, it's much uh, better than in the south of Europe. Thank you very much, Alif, and thank you for raising the point that uh, social determinants of mental health are extremely important and some of the European countries find themselves better placed than some of the other countries, especially also USA, where some of the social determinants are playing a very major role 
in uh, decreasing the level of mental health and increasing the the problems associated with that so thank you for raising the point and i would like to now invite cynthia to answer the same question how has covid changed the world and your work i think the point about the social issues is really important in this country i mean it's been had it's been hard for everybody but i think for people in the lower socioeconomic um you know areas there it's definitely a lot worse i think for everybody for kids and young adults the need to rely on technology in order to do school has been a real problem i mean we have a i mean technology is a real issue for um young people in our society and having a normal or having a healthy approach to technology is difficult and so i think it's really exacerbated people's problems and the um people's addiction to technology, they're isolate kids, college students and high school kids isolating and just doing gaming or doing technology all the time using pornography on, um, you know, through the internet, social media is so, can be so harmful to people and it's so much more available when people are on their computers all day. So that's been a big deal. I mean, I think it's also everyone's anxiety has increased and it's hard not to see that a pandemic makes everyone more anxious. And then I think people um, act out their anxiety in different ways. And so I think we need to have more awareness. I mean, there's been a lot written in a lot of, in the, in the media about you know, depression and lethargy and all sorts of things that's been helpful, but I think we need to, um, continue to normalize people's hard times with this and help and have provide more resources to help people deal with it, which aren't necessarily public service messages, but maybe, you know, popular media or um, movie stars or whoever other famous people being out there and trying to communicate and normalize. Thank you, Cynthia. In fact, uh, that those are very important things to do. But since uh, uh, you are already on the screen, I would like to ask you another question, if you don't mind. Uh, you deal with adolescents, and obviously uh, mental health uh, is important for all of them. But there are some adolescents who do have uh, a mental health problem or a mental disorder, actually. In fact, the burden of mental health problems amongst adolescents is very high. And a very large number of them go through uh, some more serious issues. In fact, 50% of all mental health problems start below the age of 15, which is a very large number. How would you think the system should be devised to identify these problems early and to be able to provide treatment? Again, I think it's not just treatment, it's prevention. And I think there's a lot of, I think we have to normalize struggling with mental health. I think we have to look, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to make change it, but our society, I think, really exacerbates the problems by, um, there is a lot, parents feel anxious. They don't, you know, the economy can be uncertain. They don't know how they're, go there's a lot of pressure to, for everyone to go to Harvard or, you know, something similar. And I think how um, parent, I think it starts with parents. I mean, I don't think that um, all the disorders are, I think they're they're treatable. I think people can have depression and suicidal ideation and even attempt suicide and then really come to the other side of it by developing ways to embrace their strengths and find healthier coping strategies. So I don't think, I think we need to normalize mental health struggles and normalize looking at our mental health. And we need to um, also, I think there's a lot of, I think there's too much um, emphasis on drugs. I mean, you see like little babies being given medicine for ADHD. And I think there are other approaches, which um, I mean, there's a lot of research about attachment theory and being parents being attuned to their kids. And if parents can reduce their anxiety, their, their children can actually do much better, starting it with babies. So I think we need to look at how to, um, help parents parent. I mean, I think that would be a really good thing. Of course, we go back to the thing. If you're you know, working three jobs and living in poverty, it's really hard to, to be there. So you have to look at, at the whole society, I think. But I do think the 
prevention as possible. I think, and also educating clinicians and educators and clergy and lawyers, because they often don't see these things or they'll say it's normal or the kid's gonna grow out of it and they don't provide the help that they need. So there's, there's that side of it too, like really educating everyone who has anything to do with kids about ways of working with them more effectively. I think we should do a lot more of that, teachers, social workers, prisons. Thank you, that's extremely important. So you're focusing attention on prevention, on normalization, and also making mental health issue much more than a health issue to, to involve social workers, lawyers, educators and other people, which is extremely important. And I think that's going to be the process by which mental health for all will become a reality rather than only mental health focused on those few people who have a real problem and need some health care. And thank you for focusing attention on over-medicalization also, which can, of course, have its own harms. I would like to know, go to now Kesley to ask her a question. You wrote an article recently about the proposed legislation to allocate funds to address social isolation and loneliness, specifically amongst older adults. Why do you think that funding should be provided? And if, if it is provided, what would that funding do? What's your suggestion? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, so this was about a legislation that's part of the Elder Justice Reauthorization and Modernization Act. Um, and the piece was for health affairs. I think it was called legislation can't solve loneliness, but it can help. Um, and so this bill, if it's passed, would allocate 250 million uh, to community based organizations that are running uh, or to run uh, programs that address social isolation and loneliness among uh, among older adults. Um, so this is exciting and important for, for a few different reasons. The first is that this is one of the first federal initiatives that would actually invest in social isolation and loneliness solutions. And I think that's important because what it signifies is that at a national level, we're acknowledging and validating the fact that this is a public health priority that really matters and influences people's health. So I think that even just that signal is, is a really important step. The second reason it's important is because community-based organizations need the support, right? I mean, there are so many incredible nonprofits and other local organizations that are already running programs to address isolation and loneliness among older adults. And they're often struggling to stay alive, right? Funding is a constant issue, especially if it's a nonprofit. Um, I've been on the board of a, a nonprofit in San Francisco called the Community Living Campaign for the past four years. And we, our, our whole mission is around addressing isolation and loneliness um, and other barriers for, for healthy aging in the city. Um, and we've had great success being able to help people feel less isolated, feel more connected to their community. Um, and I think that programs like that need additional funding and, and more reliable sources of funding to continue to sustain that impact and also to scale it and make sure that we're sharing these programs elsewhere. Um, at the same time, I would say that this particular piece of legislation missed a couple key things. One is that Surprisingly, um, the data consistently shows that loneliness is more common among younger generations. It's actually teenagers and, and young adults who experience the most, the, the highest levels of loneliness, which is kind of a, a surprising. Most, most of us, you know, when we think about loneliness, we think about an isolated older adult, and that can certainly be the case, but it's not always. Um, our youth are definitely struggling with this as well. And so I think that future legislation and funding should really make sure that the solutions we're supporting meet all ages and meet people from, from all different backgrounds. I think that's a key piece. Um, the second thing that it misses is that funding is, is really important and, and this one approach is really important, but we also need a broader strategy around this work to really move the needle in isolation and loneliness um, through many different levers. And I think for this, we can look to the UK as an example. They appointed a minister for loneliness back in 2018 and they developed a national strategy around addressing this issue, um, which means that they brought together all different stakeholders and they're really able to kind of coordinate the landscape of solutions that are in that space. And I think that's something that the US as of yet is, is really missing. Thank you so much. Uh, and also for raising the issue that loneliness is also much more uh, an issue for younger people. In fact, uh, I was part of myself uh, of a research which uh, compared the anxiety levels amongst different age groups. 
from 15 countries. And the consistent finding is that actually older people are coping up much better than the younger people. And anxiety is much larger amongst the young adults who are struggling with their jobs, with the child care, with sometimes with elderly care, and with uncertainties about income and their jobs. So thank you for raising the point. It's equally important at all ages and the, throughout the life course. And I hope this will be just a beginning for the state to actually invest. And I'm using the word carefully. It's not anything else. It's an investment because you get the money back much more than what you spent. So that's, that's really useful. But you also referred to the differences uh, between other countries and USA and how we can learn. And there I would like to invite Elif to actually share some of her experiences of how mental health services are different in Germany. You already referred to that, but do tell us more about what the USA can learn from the experience of European countries and from your own experience. First, unmute. <laughs> um, uh, I think we, I have to share with you the, the trouble of, um, I mean, we have health insurance. Okay, that's fine. But still there are a lot of barriers of, uh, um, to get treatment. And uh, the problem here is, um, uh, it's not, uh, is a lack of information for certain social groups. They don't know about um, health uh, care, for example, uh, uh, addiction treatment clinics, they think they are, they cost or they don't even know where they are and so on. So it's uh, not only a language barrier for certain groups, um, uh, societal groups is also lack of information and then in different cu cultures sharing issues is different. So we have people who are not open to, to get treatment. We have to convince them to get treatment. We, for, uh, for example, had a, um, a big research, uh, Professor Heinz and his team in Berlin showed that women of Turkish origin um, compared to women of German origin, um, the Turkish women did seven I think six or seven times more suicidal attempts than uh, the German women, although they were also raised here. So I also know that from conferences about uh, Indian, Pakistani, uh, et cetera, population living in um, England. So they have higher, um, uh, there is a different um, healthcare and mental health issues in different um, cultures and in different populations. That's, uh, uh, that's what I want to share in Germany. And also addiction is addressed differently. Some are open to treatment, some are not. And we need programs to um, get those who are in need, but who don't come. And, um, and we need also not only talk, not only speak their languages, but also um, understand their cultural issues and then um, try to, to uh, have programs. So for example, the, the uh, troubles in giving birth is, uh, and, and uh, the uh, children's uh, problems after being born is uh, way more uh, in immigrants than in, in German giving birth mothers. And uh, they don't come to the courses um, as pre uh, um, during pregnancy and so on. And we, we uh, cannot just open up a service. We have to go to the churches, to the mosques, to the, to the rabbi and, and say, uh, listen, we have something here and we, we try to, to help you. We need programs who are um, effective in uh, helping uh, the groups in need. And we have to analyze how we can get to them. Uh, it's not just about, oh, we opened a new clinic and it's totally empty because nobody is showing up. So we have to really uh, treat the physicians to know what they're doing and also psychologists, social workers, the whole team, the intercultural uh, team to, um, to address these issues in an effective, a resource effective way. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
we have now time for the questions from the audience and there are many very interesting questions so i would try to take as many as possible and would like to invite any of the panel members to to weigh in but very briefly because we have a lot of interesting questions the first question i would like to take is the involvement of uh, primary care providers we know that specialists have a role but we also know that the majority of people who need mental health care do attend the primary care and very often they are not identified and they are not provided any care so do you have any idea ideas about successful uh, experience of training primary care providers and improving the mental health care well i think people need to know the options i i've gone around to um various groups of physicians and other kinds of clinicians and educators and even clergy and talk to them about like my field and people are really interested in it, but you can't, and they say, oh, this is great. We should, you know, think of things to think about things differently, but you have, you can't just go once and then have people change. So, the, you know, the Harvard School of Public Health is, was a lot involved years ago in auto safety and they did all these things, you know, had messages on the TV show cheers about designated drivers and changing the technology. So I think we have to think about how do you create change? in a society and the society of physicians, because it's a, it's concerned, they're conservative. They're not interested in integrative medicine. They're not interested in a lot of things. So how do you get, how do we, I think they need education. They need exposure to, to, to successful solutions. I mean, maybe community, you know, they should be know about community things that are available. I mean, I think it's like a lot of multi-pronged education. I don't know. That's, I think that's interesting. And many other countries, which I'm aware of, have tried to train primary care providers simply because the specialists are, are not there. And uh, it, it turns out that primary care providers with adequate training and supervision and support can actually do wonderful work. So not for all people, but at least 70% of people can be looked after by primary care providers in a, in a very effective manner and at a cost that is much lower than the cost of the specialist. So thank you for raising that question and we go on to the next question, which is very interesting on social media. And I know that uh, Cynthia already referred to that in, in her presentation, but the question is, uh, we know that people are spending more time on the screen and, and also more uh, involved in social media, which can have positive as well as negative impacts. So the question to all three of you is, how do we increase the positive uh, impact of social media and how do we actually decrease the deleterious effects of them? Anybody? I'm happy to jump in there. Um, I think this is one of the most important questions of our time. And I don't know that any of us can, can provide the full answer to it right now. This is such a, huge part of what our society is trying to figure out. I will say that there was an interesting study done by Vish Viswanath at the Harvard Chan School, um, who was actually my advisor during uh, during my program, um, that looked at um, the differences in how people use social media. And if I remember correctly, the kind of takeaway was that it's really less about um, whether you use social media and how much, it's really about how you're using it. So it, are you using it to scroll mindlessly through Instagram and compare yourself to other people? Or are you using it to have virtual happy hours with your friends who are spread out around the country or things like that? So I think um, one answer to this question is for each of us to um, you know, be really intentional about the ways that we're using social media to engage with other people. Are we using it for support groups for depression? Are we using it to um, find resources in our communities? Or are we um, using it to kind of pass the time in, in a mindless way? That said, the other part of this question is, how are these platforms being designed in the first place? And again, this is part of a much broader conversation that I'm not an expert in. Um, but what I will say is, 
there's been an interesting and huge rise in different apps and digital tools that are designed specifically for more meaningful connection. So not just the Facebooks and the Twitters, but actual apps that, that are meant to have a user experience that's about quality instead of quantity. So I think we're seeing a lot of innovation in this space. And um, I think the, the field as a whole is so early on that I hope it can only get better from here. <laughs> Thank you so much. And also emphasizing the, the quality versus quantity and what you do on the screen rather than how much time you spend on the screen. Because, you know, in the times of uh, social isolation, social media can actually be helpful. But of course, there are many harmful effects of social media and the bullying and, and trolling and other uh, effects can actually work uh, very badly on the mental health. So, yes, careful uh use of social media especially by young people who are more vulnerable is actually uh, the key i will move on actually because i know the time is passing to another question which is also very interesting which is on peer group uh, help and especially uh, elif you referred to the uh, services for immigrants and also otherwise can peers and also people with lived experience of, of uh, mental disorders can actually help others and how? Elif, you first and then anybody. Um, this is also uh, still answering the last question and also the, the new one. Um, there was a podcast, uh, the, a new app uh, uh, called Clubhouse, but I, I just don't want to make uh, um, any... Uh, uh, ads for some app. It's uh, in all other apps, you can do that now too, but it's a form of active podcast. Uh, you can do interactions, questions and answers. You don't even have to look a certain way. It's just audio, audio podcasts talking to each other, uh, which uh, helped a lot of people uh, um, uh, who were lonely through this uh, lockdown periods. And um, we found out that uh, our um, group therapies, we uh, are one of uh, those centers offering 15 to 18 group therapy sessions per week in different languages. And uh, usually um, German colleagues don't do that, uh, but our clientele, they like group therapy because they have this a collectivist approach, they have this community, um, they, they learn to trust and share their problems. Some say, which is actually pretty uh, sad, they say this is the only, the, the best time of my week when I come to you and when I'm with you for 90 minutes, which is obviously um, uh, great for us, but sad for them, but at least they have this 90 minutes. So um, this is uh, something, and we also, uh, we try to, uh, we have um, self-help groups. We even have uh, money as support from the, um, from uh, the government or some uh, associations to, to give the people the chance to do something together, to, to, do, uh, to go somewhere, to have, uh, spend time with each other. We offer them our spaces and so on. I think um, peers can help a lot. Uh, we, we have to train the user using social media and also the person we are treating, we are helping, we are consulting to uh, get help or to interact with others to reduce loneliness. And there are really good programs. We even have a, a software developed when you don't find a therapist because you're far away from everywhere, how to do an interactive uh, software program to, to uh, process your own issues. And then we can jump into this program as the, the physician and uh, contact the people if we see they are uh, going worse, they're getting worse. If they, we see they have suicidal thoughts, then we can grab them and bring them to the office. Thank you so much, uh, Elif. Uh, I know we have only five minutes left, but I still want to ask one question to each one of you. 
we have shared a lot of information. We have also shared some suggestions on what could be done at a national level, at the therapist level and so on. I would like you to very briefly 30 seconds uh, message on what the listeners can do themselves in whatever capacity they are in. They might be government officials, they might be running a private company or just as citizens, informed citizens. What can they do for mental health and loneliness? Very briefly, please. Elif, you first. Uh, work to live <laughs> and uh, work less, live more <laughs> and contact all the people you, you love and uh, you long for and uh, spend time with yourself and be good to yourself. Oh, wow. Uh, a lot of sense there. A hard uh, uh, act to follow, but Cynthia, your take. I think to um, work really hard to see people for who they are and not see others as objects and to, um, or diagnoses and to, and to find ways of enhancing community for ourselves and for other people. I mean, what, I think um, one of the, I'll just like getting people outdoors, that's really helpful. And I do think peers can be really helpful. At, I think it's important to help to find, I guess, resources to establish community groups in all sorts of communities. Very good. Kesley. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that when we think about mental health and loneliness and these very large topics, there's a lot of systematic change that needs to happen. And that's very, very important. But I think it's equally as important for each of us as individuals, as citizens, as neighbors, to recognize that we can take initiative and we can, we have agency to change the norms in our families, in our relationships, in our communities, in our workplaces. Um, and that can be done through very simple ways. It can be as simple as expressing to a colleague that you appreciate them and thanking uh, a friend for something that, that they've done or what they mean to you. I think it can be those very simple gestures that add up cumulatively to, to a cultural change. So in addition to the important public health and essential you know, systematic change uh, work that we are all doing, um, as individuals, I think we have so much power within our own networks and, and it really starts there. Thank you so much. And in fact, thank you all three of the panelists. Uh, you have shared a lot of uh, knowledge, a lot of experience, and a lot of advice. And I'm sure the, uh, the people who are listening to this and will listen to it in the recording will really appreciate you doing that. I know that we had a lot of other questions which remain unanswered, but unfortunately, we have to close. So. I would just like to make uh, the last comments before we log off. Uh, the school, as was actually pointed out in one of the presentations, is much more involved with mental health and loneliness as topics within public health. And I think that's very positive because, you know, uh, this should start from home. This should start from the school. If you want the world to change, we need to change the school. And I think we are doing it. Some of us are working very hard to create the information, the evidence base and the programs which can actually help in that. And any help that the listeners can provide will be very useful in terms of her advice, but also in terms of any financial assistance that you can provide. In the chat, there will be a link if you want to donate, gift, anything small or large, you're most welcome because that will strengthen the school's capacity to deal with this problem, which is large and is becoming even larger. Some of the questions that were not dealt with, we'll be happy to answer offline. I would really would want to thank all of you to have joined us for this very interesting discussion, the panelists, but also the listeners and the audience who have interacted very well with this. If you have missed uh, any of the sessions earlier, watch the recording. Tell your friends and other colleagues to watch this recording because it is useful, it is interesting. And uh, thank you all the three the panelists for your lightning talks, keeping to the time, but still sharing and then answering some of the questions in such a nice way. With that, I would like to close the session. So thank you all very much. And hopefully we will meet again. Bye. Thanks.
Thank you.